All right. Looks like I went live. Uh, I was supposed to have Dr. Fry on with the prudent plastic surgeon, but of course he is in the OR. Uh, he just texted me and said that he wasn't gonna be able to jump on. So we're going to reschedule him, but, um, I'm not sure who's watching and who's not, but Hey, go ahead and comment on the, uh, on the live feed, if you got questions, uh, I'm going to stick on here for about 15, 20 minutes or so and, and see. But uh, I wanted to jump on and just kind of give everybody a rundown of, of what we're looking at doing. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Tim Shaw and I own a company called The Stream Groups, and uh, we are vertically integrated uh, syndication company. We manage a majority of our uh, stuff here in Central Ohio, and uh, we got about 650 doors that we're managing and we do um, construction in-house, uh, do um, all the property management and uh, we are uh, expanding into other states. We've got about, uh, we GP'd on about 1200 other doors uh, with a third partner that we have out of Utah and uh, we are just looking to continue to grow. Uh, we're also looking to uh, start a, I guess the Firehouse Bros brand for those of you guys that don't know, again, we have the Stream Group, which is our investment company and, uh, and then we have the Firehouse Bros which is our kind of education, kind of um, cultural uh, community that we're trying to build. You know, that was something that uh, really helped me get started in real estate was just the community that I was a part of. I had a lot of, uh, I shouldn't say a lot of, I had a few different uh, mentors that helped me along the way. I actually just had lunch with a, um, someone today and we were talking about that. And, you know, it's interesting that, that people, if you've ever heard of this, I mean, obviously you probably have, but the phrase is self-made millionaire, the self-made man. And I recently saw a video by, by Arnold Schwarzenegger where he talked about, uh, it was like a graduating speech that he was giving. And um, he talked about how he didn't believe in that and how, you know, he went from somebody that uh, immigrated here from um, Austria, came over in the seventies, bodybuilder, could hardly speak any English. And ultimately you know, became the governor of California and had all this uh, success. And he just said that he didn't believe in that um, phrase or that comment where any one of us are self-made. And so I, I, you know, I thought about that and I really, I truly agree where, um, you know, I've gotten where I've gotten in my life because of other people that are out there, other people that have helped me. Uh, you know, when I got into real estate, uh, Matt Robinson, who's in Pensacola, Florida, we went to college together. Uh, we shared a room together for a while. Um, you know, my story starts back with him where, you know, I mean, if you've listened to me at all uh, over the last, I don't know, probably year or so, uh, you know, 22 year career firefighter, uh, about seven, eight years ago was grinding it out day and night, working tons of overtime, miserable, uh, family was suffering, kids were suffering. And I reached out to Matt, I connected, reconnected with him on like, I think uh, MySpace back then and, and um, early days of Facebook. And I had gone into the fire service. He had gone into real estate. And when we reconnected, he was this multimillionaire uh, investor, hard money lender, wholesaler, flipper, like had everything covered. And I remember reaching out to him and just being like, man, like what happened? Like, how did you go from the guy that I knew and who shared an apartment with me uh, to who I see now and in all this craziness? Like it, it was just wild, right? And, and back then a million dollars to me just seemed like this arbitrary number in the sky, uh, was for anybody but me. I didn't know any better. I, I just, you know, I never thought about it. Uh, and so I reached out to him and was like, Hey, how do I get into this real estate thing? Or like, you know, obviously it's changed your life. How does it change mine? And I remember him giving me three actionable steps to take. Uh, one of the first one that he told me to do is read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which, uh, I started reading that. If you've never heard of that book, look it up, Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, it just, it changed my life. You know, it really gave me a completely different outlook on how things work on the difference between assets and liabilities. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was just uh, kind of a crazy uh, mindset shift where before all I'd ever seen it was the asset and liability situation was when I went into a bank and I was looking for to get like a car loan for instance, instance, and the form would say on one side assets, list your assets on the other side liabilities. And I'm like, I don't really know even how to fill this thing out. And reading that book really kind of opened my mind to uh, just a different way of living, a different way of thinking, understanding that, you know, me going out and buying a new pickup truck or, uh, you know, some other thing that I wanted wasn't necessarily the best thing for me because it just caused me to have to work more. It caused me to have to work more hours to be away from my family more. Uh, whereas if I could uh, have gone to, 
you know, bought something, bought an asset that paid me, uh, then I could take what it was paying me, the cash flow, and go and buy the liability that I wanted. And and now that's how I live my life. So if I want something, I'll go out and find a property or find something that's considered an asset that pays me cash flow monthly, and then use that cash flow to pay for that thing. So for instance, my my I bought a 20, 20, 22 F-150 hybrid, bought it, I built it new, and I, it doesn't cost me anything because I have enough uh, cash flow coming in from properties that, that pays for it. Uh, same thing, We my family went to Disney last February and the cash flow that I had um, from properties that I own paid for our Disney trip. So, you know, again, it, it's just a mindset shift. It was a, it was a opening door experience for me and it, and it just blew my mind. And I mean, I mean, I think every real estate investor that I've ever met has read that book or somehow had uh, that book has affected them. So that was the first thing he told me to do. And what did I do? I went and bought that book. I think I read it like in less than a week and I went back to him and I'm like, Hey, what do I do next? And then he sent me an MP3 via emails, tells you how long ago it was, uh, of a seven day house flipping course uh, that he was doing. Uh, and, he, and he had like an education program back then, like before there was gurus on every street corner, you know, he was really, truly trying to teach people and have an impact on their lives. And um, he sent me this for free. Normally he was charging 40. He's like, look, just take, you know, take a listen to this. I remember driving around in my car, uh, listening to it over the overhead, you know, looking up the email, having to push the button, the play button, and then it would play and somebody would call or something would happen and I have to start all over again. And, and uh, it's just, it's, it's great thinking uh, back and looking back at it. And so I listened to that and uh, called him back. I'm like, okay, I listened to it. I loved it. You know, I get it now what? And then he was like, find a mentor, find somebody local that was doing it. Um, and so I was like, well, who the heck do I call? I got, I don't know anybody doing it. You know, I think it's great. I get the concepts, but I didn't know anyone that was actually doing it. Uh, that one could, that I could call or two that would even give me the time of day. And lo and behold, uh, a guy by the name of Steve Baldwin, who's a great friend of mine now, uh, lives near me. Uh, he's just been a, a really good friend through everything, but he was, I actually was building a deck on the back of my house. And if you know any firefighters in your lives, you know, most of us have a uh, second job or on our two days off from the firehouse or whatever your schedule is, mine was 24 on 48 off. Uh, I would always have something else going on. If I wasn't working overtime, I was building, I was doing something in the trades. Like we just loved it. And so I was um, working with him. Uh, I was built, I built a deck, got to the point where I was like burnout, didn't want to do it anymore. Hey, Paul Vincent, I see your comment, buddy. Thanks for jumping on. Um, and I, I mean, out of pure luck, I hired his company, which he was a house flipper who had started a construction company to help flip his own houses. I saw an advertisement locally, reached out, said, hey, you know, I'm kind of burned out on this thing. You want to come over and take a look at it? Um, through that project and just talking, we, uh, I found out that he flipped houses. And I'm like, you know, man, I'll do anything to like get an hour of your time. And he was gracious enough to, you know, we went locally here, grabbed dinner, a couple of drinks um, and just chatted. And, and through that conversation, what I heard was, you know, obviously I'm asking him a thousand different things. And then he, you know, he introduced me to bigger pockets. He introduced me to um, some, you know, I look back at now, like some early step things that I have told hundreds of people about uh, like, Hey, you know, if you're interested in real estate, have you checked this out? Have you heard this podcast? Have you done this? Like, you know, these things are free. And what I heard through the conversation was that he was struggling to have anybody that he could trust to run his flips or manage them. And then also, um, the, we think you're not manage the flips and his property management. And, uh, so what I did was I was like, look, I've got, I work 24 hours, then I've got two days off. I can carve out time out of my schedule to do this. And I'm like, I was willing to do it for free just that I could, I basically could like have a kind of on the job training, uh, and learn, you know, without putting any of my own money at risk. Cause at that time I didn't think I had any money to get into real estate. I wasn't really sure what to do. And so that's kind of how the initial relationship started was I was willing to work for free. And I did that for about a year with him. Um, I helped him through a couple different flips, uh, oversaw a couple different things for him, ran material, like whatever he needed, I was there. Uh, and then I also helped him manage some of his flips. So I dealt with tenants. I was getting leases signed. I was si serving three day notices, like, you know, I remember the first time I ever had to do one and I was like super nervous, walk up to the door. Like I didn't want them to know that I was coming. I was afraid I was going to get shot. You know, it was just, it was kind of a crazy time, but, um, but I did that for about a year and that gave me the confidence and the skills and the abilities to take on my first, uh, property. 
And for me, I realized through my relationship with Matt and my relationship with Steve that if I wanted to maintain my career, which back then that's what I wanted to do, uh, I had to find a way to do this and, and make it more passive or make become big enough to where I could afford to pay for somebody. Because that's really the big thing, right, is if you get into real estate and you can you know, you get into one rental, two rentals, three rentals, your cash flow might not be enough to pay for management. And so you find yourself kind of stuck in this loop where you're the guy that they're calling to fix the toilets and the plumbing and the, you know, all the different things that can go wrong in a rental. And a lot of people never get out of that box. They never get beyond that. And so a lot of like the horror stories or the things that I heard, because I heard it all when I said I was going to get into real estate investing, I was going to try to buy rentals. Everybody was like, oh, I would never get into that because of this and because of that. And my uncle did this and my dad did this and all these terrible stories. And really, like when it came down to it, like none of that happened. And it was complete, uh, you know, it was fear on my end, but it was also a lot of people's like bad experiences that they were just telling me about. Uh, and so I worked with Steve, uh, decided again to uh, I wanted to get into this. I needed to get big enough to where I could afford a management company. I knew some of my strengths were, which were um, construction management was uh, was construction itself. I knew that I could do flooring and drywall and all these different things that were trade related because that's what I had been around or done my entire career. Um, I had also done fire inspections and building inspections. And so I knew the codes. I knew like enough to know like what I brought the value I brought to Steve was I knew enough to know that, hey, this guy's doing this wrong and we need to stop or you know, whatnot. And so it gave me the confidence working with him to know that I could do this, right? Like it took all the fear out of it, all the horror stories, all the, the um, anxiety that I had that I put on by myself just from the unknown. It took it all away. And so then I was like fully charged, like ready to go. How do I make this work where I'm not getting another job, right? Because in my world, you know, going small was going to cause me to basically pick up another job. And I didn't need that at the moment. What I needed was like relief. I needed my time back. I needed to be able to, uh, you know, really win for my family because that's my why. That was the whole reason why I got into it. That's the reason why I still do it. You can see the sign behind me right here. Uh, it says you deserve more than a pension. You know, that's a message that I continue to tell guys uh, that are in the fire service. Uh, Tim and I went to FDIC, which is like the largest national fire department convention uh, in the country. And that was our message. It was like, look, guys, like I love the job. You love the job. But when you get to the end and you've served all this time and you've beaten up your bodies and you've done all the different things that you've had to endure, when you get to the end, like that pension's really not going to be enough, especially today uh, to take care of you. And so there has to be something else that you're doing. There has to be a passive income or other streams of income. And uh, anyways, that was the, that was the uh, message that we told those guys, but, but it resonated with me. And so I realized early on that for me to really uh, get what I wanted out of my life or get what I wanted out of real estate, I had to go big. So I went into uh, a 50 unit apartment complex. And, you know, when I, I just had some of the person I had lunch with today, we were talking about this and it was like, you know, they were like, she was like, well, were you scared that, that you were going to mess it up or that it wasn't going to work or, you know, whatnot. And I was like, honestly, like, no, I, I, I knew myself enough and was able to bet on myself enough to know that like nothing could come up that I wouldn't like die on that hill for like I was not going to lose my money I was not going to lose the other investors money that invested with me it was one other person uh and you know again I, I actually uh talked with a gentleman last night via Facebook messenger because he watched a reel that we had put out and was like oh you know the just had questions and comments and you know whatnot about like oh you know yeah it's it's a, a belief thing but it's also money right and for me you're right. I was a fireman. I didn't have a ton of money. You know, I didn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars. My parents didn't have a bunch of money that they could give me to go do this. And so what did I do? Well, I realized that we had equity in our house. I pulled a, I went and got a HELOC on our house, which is like a home equity line of credit. Um, we took about $75,000 out of equity in our home. And I mean, maybe you don't have that. Maybe you get 30, 20, whatever it is. Uh, and I took that money and I went to another investor that uh, was in uh, residential real estate for a long time, but had never done a cash out refi on a bunch of properties and pitched him the idea of let's go buy this 50 unit. Like, why not? Right. Everything I had ever heard of the research I had done, the more doors uh, under one roof was easier to manage. It was easier to um, to just everything like our buying power was bigger. Our scalability was bigger. You know, we could buy a little, right, the same flooring, the same paint, the same cabinets, countertops, vanities, toilets, like everything. And it's, which is different than residential, because if you go to like, if you're flipping houses, it depends on like where the house is at, what size it is, what neighborhood it's in, the finishes have to be different. Uh, if you've got rentals and you're in your single family rentals, I mean, 
you can do some of it 100%, but not every house is going to be the same. And, and my thing was scalability. How do I maintain my career and scale this side business or this side gig big enough to where I didn't have to be the one that was answering the phone calls, uh, going and signing the leases, kicking people out, going to eviction court. Like I didn't want to do any of that. And going big was the only way I knew to get past that. And so on that first one, the way I found it, because I had, uh, it's the question that comes up regularly. Like, well, how did you find your first deal? I put together buying criteria. I went to the County that I live in the area outside of, of Columbus, Ohio. They don't have like, there's not a commercial broker that in, in Licking County, in Columbus, obviously there is, and I've met a bunch of brokers since then. And I, again, I was a new person that had never spoke to a broker before, super nervous, didn't think they'd take my call. Uh, you know, all of everything that everyone else that's never done commercial real estate is afraid of. And so I went to a bunch of real estate offices around here, you know, mainly realtors. And I gave them my buying criteria. And I was like, if somebody comes in and they are a client of yours, you know, because most guys that like in my area that have apartments, you know, mom and pop owners, they also have single families. They also have different things and they're well known within the, the real estate community. So I took my buying criteria. I said, call me if you find anything. It wasn't that long after maybe a month that somebody called me and was like, Hey, we got this 50 unit. Uh, it's kind of rough, but this is where it's at. You know, do you want to go take a look at it and see what you think? And uh, I was all over it. So I drove down there, took a look at it, uh, thought that, uh, that it was going to be a pretty amazing opportunity. Uh, again, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I thought I did good due diligence. I thought that I had uh, done great lease auditing, or, or at least I looked at the leases and was like, yeah, there's 50 leases here and they're all paying X. Uh, and so I thought that I had done um, due diligence. I thought that I had looked through everything. Um, we got the contract, got the uh, property under contract. We had, I think it was like 60 days of due diligence, 30 days for DD, and then another 30 for financing. And it was like 45 days into financing. I had been to five different lenders who said, Hey, you look great. You have a great W2. You got a great credit score. Uh, the property looks great. It cash flows as it sits. Uh, however, you have no experience uh, with apartments. We see that you've managed some properties and you've, you know, managed some flips and whatnot, but that's not enough for us to want to lend to you. Uh, and so I went through five different ones and it wasn't uh, through uh, another gentleman whose name is Mark Miller. He's a, uh, one of the partners in PM title, which is a local uh, title company here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, amazing guy been with me like since the beginning uh and he was like well hey you know like you know just candidly we're talking about this over the phone like as we've kind of worked through this whole situation and he's like well i think i've got somebody that could do this they're a, a local bank that keeps everything on their own books uh they do kind of like out of the box stuff and uh like give her a call and, and see what happens and so that's who i called and that was how i got the loan uh and the the great part about it was, or the, the part that stretched me even more from the get-go was, uh, we were probably about seven days from closing and she called me and was like, Hey, you know, I know we had kind of talked about doing 20% down, but we're going to need 25. And I was like, Holy crap. Like, where am I going to get this other, uh, 75, $80,000? Uh, so again, I, you know, my networking with Steve, he's like, Hey, I've got a private lender, uh, that, uh, that you can call, see what they say. Usually they do first position, you know, they're private money, most residential folks that use private money, the person, you know, if you don't know what that is, uh, they go to somebody who has private money, the person will buy the house or give it, you know, uh, maybe they'll cover 90%. The, the house flipper puts in 10%. And uh, then that lender takes first position, which just means that they, if that person defaults, then the lender can take over the mortgage. And so this was like a unique situation because they were going to come in, they were going to have to put a um, second position mortgage on the, on the property. And it's not like your typical ideal situation. So we, I called them scared to death, never talked to these guys before. I thought I was calling like the mob, you know, I mean, it was, it was crazy. My wife was scared to death for the whole first year that we owed these guys money. Uh, but I went and talked to them and again, they, they believed in me, right? I had enough confidence in myself to know that I could pull this off and they, I sold them on the whole situation. I walked out of that office being like, holy cow, these guys are going to give me the money. And I, I just can't believe it. So we ended up closing. Um, I had learned pretty quickly. We closed in like September, I think October, the first, uh, rent came in there. Like the first cash flow came in and I realized that, uh, something was off, right? What the seller had told me was they were, they were grossing about 21,000 a month. And I thought, well, you know, Hey, mortgage bills, insurance, you know, different things will be great. And when the, when the, uh, first payout came in from the management company, it was way, way less than what, I had originally thought it would be or what I had originally seen. And so I called them and I'm like, what is happening? And they said, well, 
uh, 12 people left right after we took over, you know, and they basically had gone around giving um, welcome packets out. And then in the middle of the night, people left. And I was like, I'd never heard of it before. Again, you don't know what you don't know on your first deal. Had no idea that that was something that could actually happen. So what do I do? I call up a guy uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. He's going to be on the show in probably like two weeks, early July. Uh, his name is Jack Petrick. Become a great friend of mine. Uh, I totally look up to him, but he's the first person that was a firefighter that had left the fire service in Ohio to do real estate full time. And when I met him, he had about 600 doors, I think. And I remember talking to him and, and I was like, he was like, he's talking a foreign language to me because I was, you know, again, I would, I got into this for to be a side gig. I never, ever, ever could have thought about leaving the fire service uh, to do this full time or to give up this pension or this whole, you know, this whole way of life that I'd known because it really is, you know, it's different than like a, a banking job or something where maybe you, you move around over your career. You know, most places when you get in, you're in and you're in it forever. And you're in it at the same place for many, many years. Uh, when I was at in Florida as a firefighter, you know, you were at that one station and if you left, you lost your years that you had served there. And so you, your clock kind of started over. So a lot of guys never leave that one station and they're there forever. Um, in Ohio, it's different because it's a state pension. And so you can move around the state and you can still stay your years uh, till retirement can still accumulate, but you, um, you know, but you don't, you're not, let's say locked into one station. So it's a little bit different uh, than it was in Florida, but he was the first person I'd ever heard of that was like, why would you ever leave that? You know, is what my thought. And he explained to me like, this was, you know, obviously he was farther down the road than I was or hop farther up the ladder, but he was like, look, you know, at some point for me, the opportunity costs became so expensive that it was costing me more to go into the fire station than it was to be off working on real estate. And um, we, I remember I was talking about the calculations he had done from the, you know, if he had in, in Ohio, you have to serve 25 years in order to get a full pension. And I think that he was at like maybe year 13, 14, something like that. But he had done the math to figure out from, you know, year 13 to 25, this is what I would make. And then if I retired at year 25 and I went to, um, I lived to be 80, let's say he retired at 52 and then he lived another 30 years. Like, what does that look like over the life, over that lifetime of money that I could accumulate or what I would get, be getting paid monthly? And he's like, if I could make that amount of money in real estate in a shorter amount of time, why would I not leave? And I thought like, it, it, again, it was like reading rich dad, poor dad. Like my mind just kind of like blew up and I was like, holy cow, like this is really, that's insane that to think that you can make that kind of money. And, and even back then I didn't know. I didn't realize getting into commercial real estate, like how amazing it was and how we could force the appreciation and how we could do all the different things that you can do uh, within commercial real estate, specifically multifamily, but you can do it in um, self storage. You can do it in uh, mixed use. You can do it in, you know, in anything, uh, you know, you control the net operating income and you can increase it. And by increasing it, you can increase the value and you can really can kind of control your own story. Unlike residential where your value is kind of based on the neighbor and the neighborhood and, who's selling what around you and the market and the interest rates. And, and, uh, so it was in my deal. First month comes out payouts way less than I thought it was going to be. I'm freaking out. I called Jack. He kind of coaxed me off the ledge. Uh, and he was like, you are way undercapitalized for this thing. I think we had 50,000 in the bank. And I thought that that was going to be enough to, uh, to really take care of everything. Um, and it clearly was not. And so he was like, you got to go out and raise private capital. And I was like, how do you do that? I've never done that. I've never even thought about doing that. So I literally was like, it's either that or everything implodes. What am I going to do? And I thought, you know what? Forget it. I'm going, I'm going to go all in. And I just started making phone calls and I started calling other people that I knew were in real estate that uh, I thought maybe would be interested in it. Um, I talked to other friends who then introduced me like, like for instance, one uh, guy that was a fireman I'd worked with for a couple of years knew me, liked me, trusted me, was like, hey, my dad would probably be interested in doing a loan. And, you know, he was one of the first investors that I ever had. Then I had another guy that I worked with at the firehouse who was also interested in doing a loan. And these were just balloon notes, you know, high interest, no equity, no guarantee other than my my um, personal uh, integrity and know-how and just kind of uh, working off of my own uh character, if you will. Uh, and so they really bet a lot on me, which put even more pressure on me, right. To, to make this thing work. Uh, and so I took that money. We, I really think I raised about $300,000, maybe 250. Um, I maxed out every credit card I had. 
Um, you know, like I was getting credit cards where you could like write a check to yourself and it was going to be, you know, like, Hey, you can get $8,000 cash, use it on whatever you want while I was buying material. Um, we, um, so what happens when you go live, if you guys couldn't hear that, I just got a call, which is kind of interesting because it's on, uh, supposed to be blocked, but anyways, so I was, was, was using any line of credit that I could get my hands on. Um, I talked to my stepdad who also came up. He, he was willing to invest with me as well, uh, and, and, um, give me some money to help with this whole project because he just believed in it. Uh, and then I did a lot of sweat equity. You know, thankfully for me, you know, I knew how to do a lot of this stuff. So I put together a team of contractors. We worked through the whole building. Um, my stepdad and I did, we installed 140 windows in this complex. Uh, we bought them. We only had enough money to buy them. We didn't have enough money to pay anybody to install them. So we installed them ourselves. Uh, we did 12. He came up from Arkansas and I think we did two weeks, 12 hour days of window installation. And then he left and then I finished um, all the exterior stuff uh, all summer. I mean, it took me three months to do it. I was down there every day. Uh, so a lot of things like that went on in that first deal. The crew that I put together of five, they renovated all the units uh, and I just kind of oversaw it. But I mean, I was running material. I was doing all kinds of stuff because like I said, I knew that if I could just get this deal to be successful, uh, Michael Blanc talks about the law of the first deal. And if you can get that first one done, it really just opens the floodgates to uh, everything else. And that's exactly what happened. Like I just blindly believed in that, that if I could get this deal to work, if I could get it to the refi, I knew I had, uh, you know, I was monitoring the net operating income. I knew what I was doing and what we were, uh, what we were, how we were increasing it. Every decision I made was based on what the ROI would be. Um, if it wasn't going to get me more rent, if it wasn't going to get me um, higher um, income coming in, then I wouldn't do it. And that was how I based everything off of. So if you've ever heard me on a podcast, you've heard like, you know, on anything that I've done, I talk about this deal, but you know, it was really the springboard into everything else. So we, we did this 14 months refinanced. Uh, we bought it for 1.7 million. Uh, we pulled out a million bucks and you know, we, everybody got paid back that was, I owed money to all the credit cards, um, all the initial investments. We paid everybody back and had enough money left over to go buy another complex. And so I went out and I bought a 30, 38 unit, uh, not too far from this one. Uh, but I followed the same seller and I thought, well, shoot, if this guy just left a million bucks on the table, by golly, I'm going to buy the next one as well because I'm just going to do it again. And that's what we did. And so we started working on that one. And, and it was kind of in the middle of, of that second one where I realized that, man, I'm not going to have any more money left to go do anything. And I'm just going to kind of be stuck. And at that point, again, being around other, I, I started to put myself in other circles uh, of people that were doing bigger things than I was. And that was one thing that they'd always said was, you know, if you're going to wait around for yourself to have enough money to do these bigger things, like you're never going to do them or it's just going to take forever. And so that was really when I dove into syndications and realized, you know, that, uh, that pooling other folks money together with sound operations, with sound execution of a business plan was something that could be really successful. Uh, and around that time I met Tim Shaw, which he's a firefighter here in central Ohio. We met through a friend that we were mentoring and like, it was just great synergy. And we were like, you know, we just knew that we could just like light, light the world on fire at that point when we met each other. Uh, and I mean, we went from, I think I had, at that point I had just over a hundred doors. Um, he had done a lot of house hacking and had some small multi, but he was really heavy into commercial real estate. Uh, he had been an agent for a while, worked on his broker license, um, was just real familiar with the whole transactional section of things, negotiating the contracts. Uh, you know, a lot of things that I didn't know to look for that I learned to look for them. Um, but he was already familiar with a lot of it. So we just really added, uh, you know, we filled each other's gaps. We filled holes where uh, I'm strong, where he's not, he's strong, where I'm not. Like, it was just great. Uh, and the big thing too, I would say that our core values lined up tremendously with family, with business, the way we operate, uh, the way we run things. Um, that really lined up uh, very well. So, you know, fast forward six years later, um, you know, through networking, you know, we, we've got, there's three of us now on our, on our team. Uh, the, the company itself oversees uh, about $186 million in assets. Uh, some of it's here in central Ohio, some of it's throughout the country. Um, but if you invest with the stream group, you know, you're getting all three of us, you're getting a ton of experience and in operations and um, development, something else that we're jumping into this year, we're working on a really big, huge development. Um, uh, Tim Wacky, he's one of the partners has a ton of uh, development experience, but this is a, the first big one for Tim Shaw and I. Uh, and again, it, you know, it's, it's fine. That was something that my mindset had to open up to is, is finding other folks that like I knew where I wanted to go. And it was like, how do I get there? And what's the fastest way to get there? And 
strategically partnering with the right people has really um, helped expand that. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody that ends up watching this, uh, if, you know, Greenlight Equity Group out of Salt Lake City, Utah, Tate Seamers, the managing member there, you have Carl York. Um, you know, those two guys, when I met them, you know, we did a couple deals with them, but again, that you know, they were another piece of the puzzle. I think that we helped them, they helped us. Like it, it's, it's all strategic networking. It's all strategic partnerships. The great thing about commercial real estate is you're not in, you're not married to each other forever, right? It's a deal by deal basis. So if you do a deal together and you're like, ah, I didn't really like the way this went or maybe the way they did something, then that's the only deal you got to do. Uh, but for us to go from, for me to go from where I was at or Tim to go from where he was at to where we're at today, strategic partnerships, uh, you know, just that. And I think, um, just constant drive working very hard. You know, a lot of guys will get on Facebook, you see them on social media and they talk about real estate and, you know, they're driving fancy cars and they're flying in private jets. And I mean, again, not, nothing is wrong with those things, but that is like one side of something that you might see. Nobody really talks about how hard it is the, the 12 hour days where you're grinding stuff out. No one's talking about, you know, buying a property uh, and realizing that, you know, maybe you missed a bunch of stuff on your due diligence walkthrough and now you're upside down in your CapEx and you're having to like navigate that to make the project successful. Or maybe you're having to eat a bunch, you know, you're a general partner, right? And a general partner just means that you're kind of the guy, control. you know, you're the group controlling the deal and you've made promises to investors and you said, hey, I'm going to give you this kind of return and you get into it and you miss something. And now in order to give them the, re the investors the return you promised them, you could say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it you know, I'm getting mine and then they're not going to get the return that you promised them. But the issue with that is, is like, you're going to be done real quick in this industry. And so, you know, the thing people don't talk about is like when they get into these situations and maybe they miss, like, for instance, we missed something in a parking lot of one of our properties. And it, it, I mean, it was a nightmare. Uh, maybe I'll do a whole nother show on just uh, the things that we've missed and the things that we've learned, but we worked through it. And, you know, and if I make $0, but the investor that I talked with in, in the, the person I promised that I would give a return to gets what I told them they would, then I, it's a win because, you know, not being focused on the current deal or the current situation, but what could happen five, 10 years down the road, even two years down the road is super important. And if you're somebody that's looking to get into syndications, like that's the questions that you should be asking uh, those you're interviewing. Um, you know, it's super important. And, and anybody that's in real estate for any length of time has had losses. They've had stuff come up. They've missed things like, you know, so it's not, you know, if you're sitting there and you're like watching this and you're, you know, you're like, oh, you get discouraged because you think everybody's doing something better than you. Like, I can tell you that that they're only showing you like one piece of the puzzle uh, as to either A, how they got there or B, you know, maybe they're not really there, but they want everybody to think that they're there. Uh, so, you know, that's something that, you know, you're never going to see me driving a Lamborghini. You're never going to see me flying in a private jet. Like, I just, that's not my style. Uh, nothing wrong with it, like I said, but it's just not something that you're going to see me do. And just because you, whether you do it or you don't, doesn't mean that you're successful or you're not successful. You know, I mean, hopefully people get that is I can go rent a Lamborghini and go take pictures in front of it, but it doesn't mean that I'm successful at real estate or that I'm a good sponsor or that I'm a good person to invest with. Uh, you know, there's a lot of that going on. Um, but anyways, that's, you know, we, we, so we've grown our company. Uh, we're doing, you know, a lot of cool things that I'm super proud of. And we also started Firehouse Bros, which, you know, if obviously the logo's on this. Sometimes you hear me talk about Firehouse Bros. Sometimes you hear me talking about the stream group and people maybe get confused. But, you know, Tim Shaw and I have always been um, educators. We've always been people that want to give back. Uh, you know, we've always been uh, like I was a fire instructor. I was an EMS instructor. So I was teaching paramedic school. I was teaching people how to save, you know, I don't want to say save lives, but, you know, the the things that need to be done in order to make, you know, tough decisions in high stress environments um, and without thinking about it. And we both taught that kind of stuff for a very long time. And I, one of my favorite things about the fire service was, um, was seeing the light come on in people's eyes or in their head when they finally got it. You know, if somebody has been trying to, has been struggling in medic school and they can't figure out cardiology, they can't figure out medicine, they can't figure out dosages. And then like one day, in the class, they like, they all of a sudden they get it and, it and the light goes on and they're super excited. Like I loved it. I lived for that. And it's the same thing with what we're trying to do now. You know, Firehouse Bros is a, a means to a trying to build a community of people where we can positively impact. We can have a true um, impact on their lives by helping them achieve the results that they want, whatever that is. 
I think it's different for everybody. Uh, but you know, we're real operators and that's the, the, the big thing. I think that, you know, there's tons of people out there that have education programs. There's tons of people out there that are willing to teach or, or talk to you about things, but really understanding who you're paying, who you're getting, um, you know, your, whose class you're attending, who you're giving your attention to, like, you know, just do your homework and do your research. You know, there's tons of folks that are great out there that are also doing it. But, you know, we got to a point where we felt like we had something to add. Um, I didn't think that we did for a long time, but I was at an event last year in Austin, Texas. Uh, Tim Bratz is a friend of mine. Um, I'm in his legacy family group. Uh, and, you know, something that somebody had said when we were at that group was, I think that, that question had come up and, and somebody said, well, you know, yeah, you may not think that you have anything to offer somebody, but if you're always looking up the ladder, right? If I'm looking at somebody that has 5,000 doors, I'm always going to be discouraged and think that I don't have anything to offer somebody. But if I turn around and I look at somebody that has 10 doors or no doors or can't, isn't in real estate or wants to get into real estate, or maybe they've been in multi or in like a residential for a long time and they want to get into a commercial multifamily or they want to make the leap into something bigger, you know, how do they bridge that gap? And that's where I think that we really can try to help folks is, like, that's what we want to do, you know, and that's, it's not based on, uh, you know, I don't care if there's 10 people that want to do this with us, or if there's a hundred people, or if there's a thousand people, like whatever it is, uh, you know, we're out here for quality and we want to really have a true impact on people's lives. And I think that we know enough, uh, that we can actually do that. And that's like the most important thing for me. I know I've, I've had people from high school, which is crazy to me to think I've been out of high school for 20 something years. And I've had folks that were older than me in high school, folks that were younger than me in high school that have reached out. Oh, I haven't talked to or seen in, in 20 plus years. And they're like, Hey, I've seen your content. I got some questions about real estate. I've been looking to get into it. Like, you know, can we talk? Uh, or I'll get people that will just message me on Facebook or Instagram or whatnot. And they're like, Hey, I, you know, I heard some, you know, one of your videos or whatever. And, and they got questions and, and being able to positively impact people's lives is, is very rewarding for me. I know it's rewarding for Tim. Uh, and, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for Steve Baldwin, if it wasn't for Matt Robinson, if it wasn't for Jack Petrick, like for these guys that have gave up their time to educate me, to kind of give me a helping hand. Um, you know, I wouldn't be where I'm at. So, you know, I know this is kind of like kind of all over the place. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Fry is going to jump back on probably sometime next week when we get scheduled. Um, but I didn't want to leave anybody hanging that was like, you know, I can't, I'm not foolish to think that people are like sitting around waiting to like watch this live that we do. Uh, but you know, I, I have been meaning to do a Facebook live for a long time. And I, and I just uh, honestly been, you know, nervous about doing a live like that in full transparency. And so I thought, you know what, this is a great time for me just to jump on by myself. Uh, it's not only over Facebook, it's over like every social media platform that we have. Uh, and so, you know, and just to kind of get that, get that uh, scary monster out of the room. Uh, but you know, that's what we're looking to do. So like I said, I think I got the, uh, the website on there, uh, the firehouse You can, you can log in and uh, go check out the website. We're going to be doing a two day, um, course, you know, we're going to do virtually at first because there's a ton of people that I know, like throughout the country that can't come to Columbus and, and, uh, meet up with us. So we're going to do like a two day thing. It's a hundred bucks. You're going to get a ton of free content. You know, we're going to give out like our LOI format. We're going to give out like a hundred questions to ask your syndication sponsor. Uh, we're going to give out, um, a copy of our, our kind of like a blueprint for our contracts. Uh, we're going to give out, oh, I mean, there's a bunch of other stuff that we're working on, um, you know, things with property management, you know, so there's a bunch of different things that we're going to offer that just going to go along if you sign up for the course. If you sign up and then you don't come to anything else, you at least get access to that. Uh, and then we're doing something called the command center, which again, it's fire department related. Our $97 things is a, uh, it's called the boot camp or uh, what is it? The, um, oh, I can't even think of it now. Um, the fire Academy, sorry, it's fire Academy is what we're calling it. And obviously firefighters, you know, career, we're just basing it off stuff that we know, you know, that's how we operate our whole business is off of SOPs and, and standard operate, you know, which is standard operating procedures, chain of command. Like everything that we do is very related to the fire service. Um, so if you join the boot camp, 97 bucks, you get a ton of free stuff, get access to, to us. Uh, we're going to go do two, two days of, a bunch of people from our network are going to jump on the calls and really trying to help people, you know, understand how they can bridge the gap from wherever they're at in real estate to uh, getting into commercial. Or if you're not in real estate at all and you want to get into real estate, you know, that's what we're there for. Uh, command center is something that we're putting together where, you know, maybe you're more experienced in real estate and you're like, I would love to buy a bigger apartment building, but um, I can't, you know, if you call most sponsors, they're not going to take your call or they're going to say, Hey, if you're, if you want to be an LP and you want to put into our deal, uh, we'll, uh, we'll take your money. 
But if you want to learn a cockpit view, if you ever heard me on a, co- a podcast, I say that a lot of cockpit cockpit view of what we're doing. Um, and because of uh, potentially you want to ultimately do it yourself, like it's a great program to get in. Um, you know, you're gonna have weekly calls with us. Uh, you know, really the, the, the there's, there's no, um, you know, nothing withheld. So uh, we've got three guys we did this with starting in January. It was kind of like our um, trial to see if it would work. And I know uh, one of them has bought a vacation home and then he's doing a big um, like a cabin commercial cabin thing in Hocking Hills, which is around here in central Ohio, which like he says is, is, you know, he's just gone way bigger than he was ever uh, thinking that he could do or believe on his own. Uh, Another uh, guy's uh, looking at closing on a mobile home park. Uh, When he met us, he had tried for I think a year, maybe two to try to get this mobile home park and couldn't get it done. We introduced him to the right lenders. We connected him with the right attorneys. We connected him with multiple other people in our network. And, and now he's closing on the deal. Um, and so sometimes like that's all it takes, right? Is maybe you're at a great spot, but you just need help kind of getting over the edge or kind of getting over the hump in whatever your roadblock is. And that, that's something that we specialize in and, and we love it, you know? And, and so you can go to the website, firehouse bros or the firehouse bros.com, check it out. Uh, or if you're somebody that's, uh, you know, you're watching this and you're like, man, this guy kind of sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Um, you know, go to the, go to the stream groups, uh, www.thestreamgroups.com. I got on the bottom here and just check out our site. You know, again, I, I, um, always love talking to folks. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's, you know, the SEC requires us, we do a lot of 506 P syndications. So they require us to have a pre-existing relationship uh, with anybody that we, that invests with us. I mean, all of our deals at this point have been 506 B. Uh, we have enough people that believe in us that we have not had to go 506 C. Um, and real quickly, the difference is um, if 506C syndication just means that you everybody involved has to be an accredited investor. And a 506B means that we can have a certain number of uh, non-accredited investors in the deal, which is what we love because, you know, we are trying to help out average guys like ourselves, um, our, my parents, your parents, you know, average people uh, kind of win big, get into bigger stuff, um, have alternative investments. Uh, and you can't do that as an average person if you're if you're non-accredited is what the SEC considers it, but you can't get into these deals um, if we're doing 506C. So we primarily do uh, 506B syndications. uh, And, you know, like I said, if nothing else, uh, reach out. You know, you can fill out our stuff on the website. Love to get to know people. Uh, Love to chat. Uh, You know, you can message me through uh, Facebook, Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, You'll find me on TikTok here and there, which has been a big stretch for me because you know, in the TikTok world, I'm old and uh, being in the fire service has really jaded me towards social media. So uh, it's a huge stretch for me to go on some of these platforms. Uh, Kate, if you're watching this, you know that that's uh, true uh, because she pushes me to do more on social media every day and uh, they make our videos look great. Uh, and so, like I said, you know, I'm an average guy doing awesome things. I love to connect with whoever uh, is listening to this or sees this at, that, uh, you know, we can help out or, uh, you know, the, we can have a positive impact and, and maybe there's some synergy or listen to this and you're like, man, this just sounds great. Uh, there's a way for us to work together. Uh, and again, the September is when we're going to do the first uh, official boot camp. So like I said, there could be three people that sign up. I have no idea. It doesn't matter. It's happening. Uh, super excited about it. Um, I love giving back. I love teaching people and helping people. And, and uh, so we're excited about that. But uh, anyways, I'm going to sign off. I appreciate uh, anyone that watches this or has watched it. Uh, I got me a comment. Hey, Jeff. Uh, thank you. So like I said, you know, I'm kind of winging it. I was expecting to interview, uh, Dr. Fry, but, uh, I appreciate you guys this time. I thank you for, uh, for, for jumping on with me. Uh, and I will catch you on the next one trying to do this once a week. So, uh, we'll get something scheduled. Thank you. Bye.